Pick up a David Wiesner picture book and the color and detail pop off its pages. A world-renowned illustrator and author, Wiesner's imaginative watercolor drawings empower young readers to use their imaginations, telling their own stories. A fan of comic books and science fiction movies, Wiesner mixes his boyhood pleasures with a dash of humor. Often, it's a place where fantasy and logic meet. We talk with three-time Caldecott Medal Award winner David Wiesner on Newsmakers. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's truly a pleasure. Uh, 70 of your most beloved illustrations are here at the Grand Rapids Art Museum. And the exhibition is called The Art of Wordless Storytelling. You've been at this for a few decades now. <laughs> um, thanks, thanks for that, pointing that out. You're, we're both maturing here, it's okay. <laughs> Take us into your studio, into your mind. What is the creative process behind wordless storytelling? Well, I think um, most people would, when they look at picture books, think, oh, you know, nice, what did that take you a couple of months to do? And um, not realizing what goes into uh, the writing of and the creating of a picture book. Um, you know, it varies from artist to artist, but uh, for me it's a, it's a very intense, very long process, generally about two years uh, to make a book. And it's, amazingly, it, it's, I'm doing what I've done my whole life since I was a kid. You know, I, I'm making up stories and drawing pictures on its most basic level. But it um, begins with just an intriguing idea, and it usually comes out of a visual idea that I've seen. And I have a number of, you know, favorite motifs that I go to. You know, things flying that don't normally fly, changes of scale, um, a whole variety of things. But there's there's usually one thing that I become focused on that I'm, you know, sort of obsessed with. And I'm drawing in a sketchbook. I'm just I'm playing around with images, um, drawing, redrawing, and it's really the drawing process that generates ideas. Um, you know, someone who says, well, I'm going to get up and go take a walk and try and think up ideas, you know, I don't buy that for a second. Uh, you have to be working. It's, it's the act of doing that triggers ideas, something you're doing, you say, oh, this reminds me of this and you make connections and it may take you down a path where you say, well, that's not where I want to go, but, um, and then you find another direction that will. Uh, the accumulation of drawings, you know, and it connects with memories and things in my head and out of that, something comes out and it's, it's hard to uh, describe that and it, unfortunately, it's not a predictable thing. I would love it if I could just go, okay, you know, this will happen in this time frame. And some happen quickly and some don't. But once that idea sort of begins to take shape and I can see that there might be a story in it, um, that's the key thing because all of this art um, is about f making the story go forward. It's there to give the reader, the viewer, um, the experience of that world. Who's the character? What's going on? Where does it take place? Understanding it. Everything I draw is all focused towards um, advancing that story. So the story is key. And so I have notebooks and sketchbooks full of interesting visual ideas, but getting one of those to come together into a story is the key thing. And that can, as I said, can take a shorter, long period of time. Um, once, once I sort of see it, then, I mean, that's where the fun begins because then I'm now heading down a trajectory that I know um, I can just fill this story with the most interesting or strange or wonderful stuff that I can think of uh, to visualize that story. And a lot of it, you know, I have to go out and do research and find reference materials for, learn about stuff that I'm going to draw. Um, so, you know, there are a section of a, a book where now I'm, I, you know, recently I, I had to drive. I live in Philadelphia. I drove over to the Jersey Shore um, to spend the day going up and down the boardwalk, not only to kind of get pictures of people 
what do kids wear today? I mean, I, you know, uh, I want to get some of that stuff, but also the, the arcades, um, the boardwalk itself, the pier. I went down under the pier to photograph the joists and how it's constructed um, to have all this as material to come back so that I can create not a photographic representation of it, but a convincing representation to make that world look like um, what it is. And that really is a build up to the point when I um, introduce fantasy. And so what I'm trying to do is create a world that feels real. Usually a very ordinary world, a backyard, you're on a school trip down at the beach, so that when the fantasy enters, it, it somehow stands out in relief even more. You know, it becomes even more fantastical for existing in that ordinary world. So, you know, that period of working on a book, there are, there are phases of me just sitting in my studio day after day after day, um, drawing, going out, collecting uh, materials to use. And the last, the very last thing I do is actually paint the pictures. So all of the art here in the museum is the end result of this long buildup. Um, I can't sort of separate the two. To me, um, they're one part of a long continuum, but um, for the viewer, you know, they don't have to know that, to obviously to enjoy it, but um, you know, it is great to be able to have a situation like this, an exhibit which allows people in to see some of what goes on and goes into the making of something as uh, complicated as a book, really. I mean, it's a simple picture book, but um, it involves uh, not only painting, drawing, graphic design, topography, a lot of different disciplines come together uh, to create that end uh, book that you're seeing. I have children, so I have some familiarity with your work. You talked about having that visual spark, just drawing. Is the book Tuesday a good example of this? Yeah. Um, Tuesday uh, was one of the fastest books I did. And um, I, so it took me about a year, but it was something that happened um, I wasn't even looking for it. I had a contract for a different book. And I, when I finished the previous book I was working on and started to think about that next book, um, I had actually uh, done a cover for a children's magazine called Cricket Magazine. Cricket is still in print. And um, they said, we have in this issue lots of stories about frogs and St. Patrick's Day. I guess green was the, the common thread there, I don't know. But I thought, I don't really want to do St. Patrick's Day, but frogs, I mean, how cool are frogs? They're just really weird looking, they have these big bulgy eyes, and they're kind of squishy and long, you know, toes or fingers and interesting patterns and stuff. So I did what I do, I just started to draw some frogs. And in my sketchbook, you know, a few pages of them. And because I was drawing them, I was sort of enjoying the shapes, and then I drew one sitting on a lily pad. And this is the moment, you know, you can't plan for, but the shape they made together, the sort of domed blob of the frog sitting on that flat circle of the lily pad, I looked at that and I didn't see a frog on a lily pad, I saw a flying saucer. Your classic 1950s, you know, science fiction movie, Flying Saucer, which I spent much of my youth watching. And I went, whoa, that's neat. What if I make the frog and the lily pad fly like a flying saucer? It's like, how cool, flying, for flying frogs. And so I did an image for the cover of Cricket, but I said, I love these frogs, I love them, they're flying. And I sat down, and in my sketchbook, and the sketchbook is here in the, under a case in the museum, on a single page, um, I always begin by drawing out um, 32 pages. Most picture books, the standard length is 32 pages and the story just kind of flowed out. Um, frogs, there's the image, the first page in the book. Um, in the middle of the night, it's a typical night, they're asleep in the swamp on their lily pads and suddenly the, it's the lily pad that's flying. It's like a little magic carpet and the thing raises up and the frog is, whoa, you know, what's going on? So you just sort of follow the train of thought. Well, they're in the swamp all the time. What are they going to do now that they're mobile? Get out of the swamp, right? They go into the town, you know, all the people live. And it just, you know, they have a series of adventures. 
and um, within a little more than an hour, I had the entire uh, set of thumbnails for the whole story. And if you looked at look at those little images in the case in the sketchbook, if you bring your book with you, um, you'll be able to read every one of those pages. It changed very little, even though they're only this big and they're very sketchy. Um, it it just almost intact became, I mean, obviously I had to then go on and develop it and look at frogs and make models and, and build, you know, this whole world. But um, that was one where that, in, that just flash of inspiration produced something whole, which then um, I took to finished uh, paintings. Sadly, they didn't all <laughs> come that easy. Uh, some, you know, there was a real, real journey to figure out what the story is, but um, it's nice when it, when it happens like that. But again, it, it all came out of that drawing, you know, putting down those, uh, making those frogs, making that li lily pad, looking at that, looking at the shape, just, you know, making that connection, and just like that, there it was. Um, you know, it's like magic. You mentioned 1950s, you know, old science fiction movies, the UFOs. Your childhood influences. Uh, you were the kid who could draw. There's also a lot of comic book uh, imagery and the way the pages are set up. How much of a childhood influence is there and how vivid are those memories still today and how they are entering into the work that you do? Um, comic books were a huge influence. I still have my issues one through a hundred from the Fantastic Four. That was my um, my my superhero gang, and um, that's really the place that I just saw, I saw stories being told in pictures. I loved film. I loved watching movies, and you know uh, the way movies are put together. I did filmmaking in school, um, but. Comic books, you know, take that and isolate those moments. And the beautiful thing in um, comics is um, the jump from panel to panel. Um, you know, it's the space, they, they say, you know, the space between the panels is the key thing because your, your mind is filling in what happens in between the two. And being able to then take some of that um, and changing it and, and often um, simplifying it a bit and bringing it into the picture book process was something that I was looking to do. And Tuesday was the first place that I've, uh, I did that and it continued to be part of the books that I've done. But um, it's uh, a, you know, a really uh, rich visual language you know, unto itself, the, the, the world of the comics. And uh, obviously they're huge today even more popular than ever um, so it, it certainly is something that has not gone away and uh, you know I yeah I did not uh, rot my brain as they would say you know reading comics it, it did me well yeah it has I mean because as you look around and there's that watercolor feel that you've introduced to what would be most comic books as well would have that kind of look. Uh, why watercolor and have you ventured off into some other yeah, areas? Um, watercolor uh, I came back around to at the very end of my time at uh, art school. Um, I had been uh, doing battle with a variety of other media, particularly oil on paper. Um, and it was really at the end of my junior year that I, I had completed a, a big piece. And I, you know, I'd achieved certain things with it. You know, the, the final crit went well. And we had one more um, uh, assignment before the end of the semester. And I was like, oh, I can't do that again. And I thought, I'll just, I'll pick up watercolor for change and do this last piece that way. And it was like, oh, whoa, this is really nice. It felt um, very good. So. From the beginning of my senior year, right through that whole year, um, I focused on watercolor. I took an independent study. I uh, had one of my main classes was um, uh, the kind of uh, using watercolor in the way that I do it, which is building up layers of color. Because they're transparent, 
you put down you know one layer the one that goes on top of it is going to be affected by the color under it so you know a blue going over yellow is going to give you greens and you can really shift and change the color as you're putting layer after layer and there's a lot of layers of paint it's a it's a laborious pro process and it takes um, it takes a long time and you you have to have a certain amount of patience for it i have the kind of personality that it it appealed to, but it, it achieves a certain color um, and look that I don't know any other way to get. So I really, um, for quite a number of years, focused solely on watercolor and doing my books. Um, eventually, though, I started to, you know, branch out and think, okay, let's change it up a little bit because that's always a good thing to do and um, started to work with acrylic, some pastel, colored pencils, um, a variety of other uh, media like that. And uh, still, you know, always coming back at some point to watercolor, but um, it was, it, it actually was really nice to be able to paint something with opaque paint. If I wanted to, I could just paint over it. With watercolor, you can't do that. <laughs> but technically it's interesting when you look at the three little pigs, you, you take it to the next level. And as the pigs go through this story, which You've changed. Indeed, yes. Uh, you see a couple of different new entries into your creativity. Yeah, that was, uh, that was so much fun to do. Um, essentially, uh, the big bad wolf huffs and puffs so hard he blows the first pig out, right out of the story. You know, comes out of the frame of the picture. So I needed um, a look for what the reality outside the story of the three little pigs would be. So within the story, it's a relatively flat, you know, watercolor painting. There's an ink outline around everything. Um, harkens back to early American turn of the century uh, illustration look. But when it comes out, you know, the ink line is gone and suddenly it's fully three-dimensionally modeled, casting a shadow and there's texture and so and it's also painted not just watercolor, but with some gouache and uh, colored pencil. Um, so the world outside the story has a look. And what they discover inside when they knock down the pictures of the book is that all the other stories are back in this huge blank space. So when they go in and out of those stories, they adopt the illustration style of those stories. So it goes from a Howard Pyle-esque pen and ink drawing Another one is a very brightly colored mass market uh, version of uh, Hey Diddle Diddle, The Cat and the Fiddle, which was my little jab at the early textbook work that I had to do, I had to do, but you know, I did to make money when I got out of school, where their mantra was always, make it brighter, make it brighter, and my color palette was not bright, so um, I made this as garish as I could. So the, the pigs go in and go, yuck, and then, you know, jump back out. So it was really nice to uh, be able to break up um, and introduce all these different looks um, within the story. That, that was great fun to do. And fantasy is so essential to all of these stories. Uh, yeah. June 29th, 1999, there's Mr. Muffles, uh, and then Sector 7. Mm -hmm. um, but for kids, while it's very whimsical, you like to ground things in things that to make it factual right that because kids are going to ask questions oh. intuitively and yeah. you want those answers to be somewhere in the storytelling um, you know you, you have to the world you create has to have abide by the rules that you've set up you can't just start oh you know this is the way things are now i'll just change it because i think that would look cool or something you know the logic of it uh, a, Boy, kids, kids are the most perceptive readers ever, and they notice absolutely everything, and they will call you on it. So um, I'm always, you know, uh, wh whatever decisions I'm making, um, I have to ask myself, how does that work within the parameters of what I've set up? Uh, in my book, Art and Max, you know, it's set in the desert in the Southwest US, and um, sort of like, uh, I mean, a lot of other sort of surreal Southwestern things, including Coyote and uh, Roadrunner. Um, so there's at some one point, there's a vacuum cleaner, there's a giant fan, there's some other electrical things, which I knew, I'm, and in fact, it has 
was born out that way, um, that someone would ask me, well, where do you plug these things in? And it doesn't take much. Um, on the title page, um, if you look in the book, there's a little house in the background. You know, it's very small, but it's sitting back there. And so you can say, well, you know, there, that's where it's plugged in. There may be a long cord, but that's where it's plugged. So, um, you know, you have, to, you have to think about these things. You know, obviously in Roadrunner and Coyote, they, stuff just appears and, and, and happens to work. But in a book, you know, I think you really have to be able to um, uh, think about uh, the reality of that world. So um, I like, you know, uh, try to advance guess what kids, you know, think like that kid um, who's looking at those pictures and going, wow, that's kind of cool, but how does this happen? You know, how does that work? Because um, I like to think about it too. And, it, and frankly, it makes it more interesting in the end. You know, it's just, it's more uh, detail and uh, interesting uh, imagery most often that I can add to that world to make it even more uh, either funny or strange or believable. You're creating these worlds and yet to a young mind who's making their way through the pages, they're creating their own stories. How empowering is that for a kid? Well, the, um, the idea behind wordless storytelling, uh, which there is in fact a long history, um, not only um, in picture books, but um, in a lot of other kinds of storytelling, but in uh, the picture book world, uh, they've been around, although kind of floating under the radar in to a large degree. Occasionally you'll get one that surfaces like Raymond Briggs' The Snowman, which in large part I think was helped by that beautiful short film that was made of it and had a hit. The music became, you know, a hit uh, recording. Um, so, I mean, that was thrilling to see a piece of wordless storytelling uh, jump into the uh, consciousness like that. But the thing that, um, I, well, I came to it because when I saw examples of it, I just went, oh, this is what I have to do. I love this, you know, telling stories and pictures alone. When I began to uh, make wordless picture books, lo and behold, yes, I get piles of letters. Uh, teachers, librarians, kids themselves would send letters and that feedback um, allowed me to really understand the you know, relationship between the reader and the, and the wordless book because the, the wordless book is taking away my voice, which would be the text. That's not there. And that's now being supplied by each person who reads the story. They can read it however they want in their own voice. Um, there's no right and wrong way. And so it becomes a collaboration. Um, they're completing the book by telling the story. And you know, I made it, it's out of my hands, it goes into the world. So however it's, uh, it's read is, um, it's not my business, and uh, it's wonderful to see, you know, hear kids uh, tell their versions. And one of the interesting things it seems to always do is trigger this desire to retell it um, in words, in pictures, or, you know, Tuesday, the, I have mounds of next Tuesdays, you know, what happens the next week. Um, and it, it's uh, so exciting to see this creativity come out. Um, the other place that, uh, I, I, again, I had no idea that this would happen, but um, in situations where the text is an issue for the reader, whether they're non-English speakers or um, have reading difficulties, the reluctant reader, all the, the various terms, kids in school who, you know, may um, be afraid of the word on the page or just, you know, not speaking up. When teachers say, okay, you know, read this book and it has no words and suddenly they're empowered to tell the story and out comes this outpouring of stuff, you know, you think, well, this, the, the child is maybe not, uh, doesn't have an imagination or they're not writing as well or what, and, oh my gosh, you know, in there is this incredibly creative kid you've, you've let loose and, um, the, the first time I've heard it and the hundredth time I've now heard that, it's always just an amazing thing to, to think that these books that I've made are, you know, giving that uh, out because, I mean, I'm not a teacher, I'm not creating them through an educational thing, but the fact that they have that life is one of the most satisfying parts of, uh, of 
having been in this, uh, in this business. Well, satisfying to parents is what you're doing with the next generation of kids, and that is using an iPad. <laughs> Briefly tell us about this before we let you go. Sure. Um, so uh, there was a story idea, and a, there's a couple pages from my early attempts at making a picture book of a story called Spot. Um, but it didn't, wasn't working in book form. I mean, it probably could have, but the story just somehow wasn't coming together in a way that I was satisfied with. And when the iPad was introduced and I first saw one, um, basically the concept is there's a whole series of worlds within worlds. You can go down, it, it's the, a bug, and there's a spot on the back of the bug. And if you go into the spot, it becomes an island, and in the island is a house, and through the roof of the house, um, there's a cookie on the table and then you go into the cookie and the cookie takes you into cavern and it just keeps going deeper and deeper into these various layered worlds. And I, um, I was happy to, you know, use a new technology to play around with because they're not going anywhere. These technologies are, you know, with us and we really have to figure out how to tell stories with them that aren't just, you know, games. You know, I, uh, my belief in the power of the story. Um, so that, that was my attempt and I was, I was really happy to uh, have a chance to, you know, well, okay, let's go over here and try that and uh, find a solution for uh, a story idea that, uh, you know, wasn't working over here, but now um, here's another form that allowed me to bring that out. Well, from the pad to the page, you're making parents happy everywhere. David Wiesner, thank, thank you so much. much. I appreciate it. Thank you.